Sometimes just driving in the wrong vehicle is enough to earn the ire of a notorious motorcycle gang. From hiding bodies in concrete to killing entire families, these are the worst crimes ever committed by the Hells Angels. It took more than a decade for Hells Angel Thomas Nesbitt to be brought to justice in Nebraska for the 1975 murder of 19-year-old Mary Kay Harmer. Harmer was a former high school friend of Kathleen Ray, who lived with Nesbitt. On November 30th, Ray invited Harmer and her roommate Gayla Jorgensen to what she described as a housewarming party. Nesbitt was waiting at the house, and after the women arrived, it wasn't long before Ray and Jorgensen left, leaving Harmer alone with the biker. Details are sketchy, but it was outlined in court documents that Nesbitt later admitted to Ray and his next-door neighbor Wayne Bieber that he may have sexually assaulted Harmer. Nesbitt decided to kill her rather than risk the chance of her going to the authorities. Bieber later testified that he burned Harmer's clothes, and the trio wrapped her body in carpet before dumping it in a manhole in an unfinished housing development. When Harmer's skeletal remains were found nine years later, forensic investigators were able to determine that Nesbitt had unsuccessfully attempted to dissolve her body with lye before disposing of it. Nesbitt was convicted of murder in 1986 and sentenced to life in prison. In 1971, a group of Hells Angels descended into New York City for the funeral of Jeffrey Coffey, one of their own who had been killed in Ohio a week earlier. While in town, several of the men decided to order some new leather from Eugene Pritzert, who owned a leather goods store in the East Village. When they returned to pick up their order, they were told that it wasn't quite ready yet, and that's when all hell broke loose. A gang of eight men began beating up Pritzert, and then a new target happened upon the scene, a 17-year-old female friend of the proprietor who was in town visiting him from California, and who had been napping in a back room. For six hours, the men guarded Pritzert while beating and sexually assaulting the girl, until Pritzert finally managed to escape and alert the police. All eight men fled the scene, though they were later identified in the lineup by their young victim. They were slapped with a series of charges that included sexual assault, criminal trespass, and unlawful imprisonment. In October 2001, members of the Mesa, Arizona chapter of the Hells Angels took part in a crime for the pettiest of reasons. 45-year-old Cynthia Garcia had been brought back to the clubhouse to party by a biker under consideration for membership in the club. According to the book Angels of Death, Inside the Biker's Global Crime Empire, Hells Angels Kevin Augustiniak and Paul Eishide became violent with Garcia when she refused to participate in a sexual act. She was then thrown to the floor and attacked until she lost consciousness. Augustiniak and Eishide then threw Garcia in the trunk of a car and drove her out to the desert they stabbed her to death and partially decapitated her. Augustiniak would be convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 23 years in prison, while Aisha had received a 19-year sentence on the same charge. This guy uh, hopefully will, uh, will uh, never get out of jail, at least for a long time, for, for what he did. The 1977 quadruple murder that took place in the rural town of Gaston, Oregon might never have been solved if not for its sheer brutality. Young children were killed in cold blood, an act savage enough to make Hell's Angels break their own code of conduct and become informants. In August of that year, 24-year-old Margot Compton was killed for the transgression of testifying in a pimping trial against Hell's Angel Otis Garrett, for whom she had served as a sex worker. Compton wasn't simply killed, though. Instead, her killer, Angel affiliate Robert McClure, first forced her to watch as he coldly executed her 19-year-old friend Gary Seslar and her six-year-old twin daughters. McClure and Garrett weren't convicted of the murders until 1994 and 1995, respectively. Their convictions happened thanks to the cooperation of inmates who had heard McClure's boast about the crime while he was in prison for other offenses. The two men received identical sentences of four consecutive life terms in prison. In 1984, a member of the Hells Angels Nomads chapter named David Richards was sent to prison for life after he brutally killed a 16-year-old boy named Michael Groves in England. He stabbed him over 50 times and wrote Hells Angels on the wall in his blood. Richards was sentenced to life in prison for the crime, but in 2005 he managed to escape and he remained hidden for nearly a decade. Living under an assumed identity, Richards claimed disability benefits, went on vacations, and basically lived a normal life. When he was finally recaptured in 2014, Groves' family made it clear that they were incensed that the perceived lack of effort on the part of the authorities to snare Richards. In response, Derbyshire Assistant Chief Constable Carl Smethen explained that since Richards was from London, they assumed that he'd be hiding out there, which turned out not to be the case. In the summer of 2020, the Jake's Roadhouse Bar in Arvada, Colorado became the site of a furious gun battle between members of the Hells Angels and rival biker gang the Mongols. The dispute began in the parking lots and quickly spilled out into surrounding blocks. By the end of it, 43-year-old Hells Angel William Henderson was dead of a gunshot wound, while two of his friends were hospitalized with multiple gunshots. Additionally, two uninvolved individuals were injured after being run off the road by fleeing bikers, and another was clinging to life after attempting to break up a fight. That man was Ryan McPherson, the lead singer of the rock band Nightwolf, who had just finished up their first set when all hell broke loose. McPherson's bandmate Jay Halpern told CBS News that his buddy stepped in when he saw a man being beaten with a motorcycle helmet. That weapon was then turned on him and he suffered a traumatic brain injury. Seven months after the incident, ten individuals had been arrested and McPherson was
was still on the road to recovery. We couldn't believe what was going on. Hells Angels member Robert Garceau and his girlfriend Maureen Bautista were involved in the manufacture of methamphetamine, and the relationship was a volatile one. In the summer of 1984, Garceau became suspicious that Bautista was thinking of revealing his location to Eddie Nash, a drug dealer to whom Garceau was indebted. Then in September of that year, Garceau's suspicions apparently overtook him, and he stabbed Bautista to death at her apartment in front of her 14-year-old son, Telus Foro or turning the knife on the boy as well. He and several accomplices then smuggled the bodies out in a dresser and concealed them under freshly poured concrete. While no physical evidence linked Garceau to the crime, he reportedly blabbed about it to anyone who would listen. He was eventually convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. He died of cancer while on death row in 2004 at the age of 58. David Glasser spent his last few years in mortal fear of Adam Lee Hall, sergeant-at-arms of the Berkshire, Massachusetts chapter of the Hells Angels. A potential witness in an assault case that had been brought against Hall, Glasser had been threatened, intimidated, and beaten up by the Hells Angel. The campaign of harassment ended when Hall and his friends Caius Veovis and David Chalou abducted and killed Glasser and two others in August 2011. Glasser, his roommate Edward Frampton, and his friend Robert Chadwell were snatched from Frampton's house and taken to an undisclosed location, before they were shot dead and dismembered with a circular saw. Hall, Veovis, and Chalou were all found guilty of the murders in 2014, with Hall sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. The healing process can begin. One of the most heinous crimes in the history of the Hells Angels was carried out by Gerald Lester and Charles Diaz of the Vallejo, California chapter. In 1986, William Grondolsky was expelled from that chapter for reasons that remain murky. Authorities later determined that he may have kept contact open with Terry Dalton, a disgraced former member, and may have also been selling drugs on the side in his club's territory. Whatever the reason, on October 1986, Lester and Diaz paid a visit to his house that Grondolsky shared with his wife Patty, his 17-year-old stepson Jeremy, and his 5-year-old daughter Dallas. An argument ensued, and Lester shot Grondolsky in the face with a 9mm pistol. Not wanting to leave any witnesses, he then shot Patty and Jeremy as well. Diaz then attacked the young girl with a knife. Lester complained that it was taking too long to finish her off, so he fatally shot her. The two then set the house on fire to attempt to cover up their crimes, but they left behind enough evidence to point investigators in their direction, and both were eventually sentenced to life in prison. In February 1988, Sandusky, Ohio music store manager David Hartlob was found shot to death beside his van. He had arrived at a bank to make his nightly deposit, and at first it appeared like a robbery gone wrong. But then, police discovered that the deposit bag containing about $4,000 in cash hadn't been touched. The trio of men responsible were affiliated with the local Hells Angels chapter, but their targeting of Hartlob was a tragic case of mistaken identity. The men were attempting to eliminate a member of the rival outlaw gang as payback for the shooting of one of their own a year earlier. That man coincidentally happened to drive a van that was identical to Hartlob's. This misidentification led to the Hells Angels shooting Hartlob with a 9mm pistol inside his van. One of the perpetrators suffered a ricochet wound in the process, causing him to leave bloodstains that served as evidence. Stephen Wayne Yee, Mark Verdi, and John Ray Bonds were all convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and federal firearms offenses. And there's really very little that a defense attorney can say when faced with a case like that. Kevin Thorpe and Laura Craig were a young couple who in 1981 made the fatal mistake of stopping for some gas at a convenience store. That was where Hell's Angel Benjamin Psycho Silva and two friends, Joseph Shelton and Norman Thomas, happened to be hanging out. The trio had their eyes on Craig, and when the couple departed, they followed. They used a dashboard light to trick Thorpe into pulling over. Silva and Thomas then forced their way into the vehicle, and they drove the couple to a remote cabin owned by Shelton, with Shelton following in his car. They tied Thorpe to a tree, leaving him outside in the blistering cold overnight while they repeatedly sexually assaulted Craig. Finally, Silva and Shelton untied Thorpe, only to lead him to a hilltop where they took turns shooting him with an assault rifle. They then drove Craig a short distance up the road, made her get out of the car, and shot her dead. Silva and Shelton were eventually sentenced to life in prison, while Thompson received an 11-year sentence after providing evidence against his accomplices. In February 1972, Alameda, California longshoreman Bradley Parkhurst and his friend Clyde Burke went to the home of Connie Perry, who happened to be the girlfriend of a man who was close with two Hells Angels, Russell Bia and Marvin Gilbert. Perry brought the visiting pair down to the basement, where Gilbert was working on a motorcycle frame. Gilbert commented negatively on the way Parkhurst shook hands by using a racial slur. When Parkhurst took offense, a fight broke out between the two of them. Perry ran to get Bia, who quickly descended the stairs and pushed Burke up against the wall. Gilbert then proceeded to beat Parkhurst until he was near death and begging for him to stop. Gilbert and Bia eventually did relent. They left, leaving the others to tend to Parkhurst. It was twice attempted to revive him by injecting him with methamphetamines, which prompted him to go into convulsions. After three and a half hours, Parkhurst died, and the condition of his body left little doubt as to what had happened. Gilbert and Bia were ultimately found guilty of second-degree murder. 
If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact RAIN's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.